I came here with my late husband 22 years ago. Rainbow Valley Farm is 50 acres and about 25 of those are native bush or regenerating native bush. So we're using about 25 acres for our gardens, orchards and our pasture. We have two house cows which we milk and make cheese and butter and quark and yogurt. And we have four, four or five sheep as well. And ducks, chickens, geese, guinea fowl, pigeons. This land had a very sad history. More than a hundred years before, the first European settlers had come in and taken out the good timber from the forests and they'd burnt off the rest to create pasture for sheep and cattle. But this is steep land and it's rainforest land. The soils are very, very fragile. And in the heavy rains that came, the little bit of topsoil that was left was washed off those hills down into the stream and went out to sea. So when we came here, there was very, very little topsoil and the subsoil was heavy clay, which became a bog in winter and it was like concrete in summer. We discovered permaculture in 1985. Joe came home one day with a book called Permaculture One by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren from Tasmania. And he was so excited and we read this book and it made sense to us, this concept of permaculture because it brought together under one umbrella all the different strands of ecological wisdom that were important to us. And so we studied it and we came here and this land, there was no buildings, there was no infrastructure, so we had a blank slate to work with. And we set about putting all our new permaculture knowledge into practice. One of the first things we needed to do was grow soil and stop erosion. And we immediately started propagating and planting trees. We planted a thousand trees a year and quite quickly we stabilized the erosion and then we concentrated on building soil. And we started to face some of the problems that this land had. For example, we had about 30 acres of gorse, six foot high gorse, and it was a nightmare actually. But being good permaculturists, we knew that the, the permaculture saying is the problem is the solution. So we thought we've got to try and make this stuff work for us. And of course, gorse being a nitrogen fixer was bringing nitrogen out of the air and fixing it in the soil and improving the soil. So we made tons and tons of compost from that gorse. And we also used it to fence in our chickens, big heaps of gorse around a, the chicken yard and we planted our brand new little fruit trees and put piles of gorse around them to stop the possums from eating them. That was another problem we had. The, this area, this farm, borders on to a thousand hectares of native bush and the possums just continually migrate into the area. So we knew if we wanted to have any food we had to control the possums. So I think we killed many thousands of possums in the years that we've been here. Just about every fruit tree in the orchard has a possum buried underneath it. It was good nutrient. We started to, to, first of all, to observe what we had here. For the first six months, we just observed. We did a sector analysis. Where did the sun, summer sun come up? Where did the summer sun, sun go down? Where did the cold winds come from? Where did the warm winds come from? By the end of six months, we had a pretty good handle on what we were dealing with here. We'd identified all the microclimates and decided where the best place was to put a house, where to make our gardens. And we, we worked out what we needed to do to get some shelter from the cold winds from the south. And we planted a wonderful wind shelter, a mixed wind shelter with timber trees, firewood trees, uh, bamboo, native trees for the native birds, uh, and flax, 
and other um, shrubs. And this worked really well. It provided shelter for our nursery and for our orchard. And then we began planting our orchard up with all kinds of mixed fruit trees. One of the very successful things we planted was the Ethiopian banana. It doesn't have edible fruit. The fruit have too many, too many big seeds in them. But it grows very fast and very vigorously. And it created a huge amount of biomass. So we planted a lot of things just for biomass to create soil. And over, over 20 years, we, we've built up the soil here. Our gardens now have probably half a metre of beautiful black humus that's been created simply by making compost and by mulching. We made hundreds of tonnes of compost here. And of course, we did a lot of worm farming because worm tea and uh, vermicast is fantastic fertilizer for the garden and this land has now become highly productive it's been transformed we wanted to have fruit all year round so we chose varieties of apples the early apples the late apples the early plums the late plums because we want to to, to extend the seasons as long as possible so our mixed orchard contains subtropical fruit trees like bananas, cherry moya, tamarillos, babaco, pawpaw, passion fruits of course. And then in our temperate zone orchard we had apples, pears, peaches, plums we could harvest all through the year. Macadamias grow very well here. We get a great crop of macadamias each year. We grow the shiitake on oak log logs in the forest and the oyster mushrooms we grow on cardboard boxes stuffed with banana leaves. We have grape vines all around the place. We harvest a lot of grapes in summer and um, we also have a rice paddy and we also grow water chestnuts and watercress. We do have our own olive trees and we pickle probably 30 or 40 kilos a year. And occasionally, if we have a bump a year, we have enough to make some oil, but not enough to keep us going in oil. We sell honey on the farmer's market. We have a stall down in the village of Matakana every Saturday where we sell our products, honey, eggs, fruit and vegetables and plants. And we also do a lot of preserving for our own use. We make pickles, jams, chutneys, dried fruit. We have a beautiful solar dryer that just uses the energy of the sun to, to dry our fruit. When we first came here, we looked into alternative power, but it's not windy enough in this valley for windmills. We had an expert come, but that wasn't going to work. And um, at that time, solar panels were very, very expensive. It was actually cheaper for us to get the grid in here. Although now we are slowly moving over to uh, solar panels for our hot water production. And then when the sun's not shining, we use the, the wood stove, the wet back from the wood stove. We still use fossil fuels on Rainbow Valley Farm. We still have a little tractor and we have a ute, but we try to use them as little as possible. We try to use, wherever possible, renewable energy for whatever we need to do. But we still do use fossil fuels, but carefully. We knew that we wanted to live in a healthy house. We didn't want to have any toxins in this house. We wanted all natural building materials. And we wanted to build it from materials from as close as possible to this site. So we were extremely lucky. We had a big stand of Mark Ricarpa trees on the property. So we milled those. And Mark Ricarpa is a wonderful building timber. It has natural oils in it, which means it doesn't need any chemical treatment. So <clears throat> we used Macrocarpa for most of the buildings and the sarking here. We got some rec recycled cowrie be beans from Auckland from a warehouse that was demolished. Beautiful big cowrie beans. 
and we made thousands of thousands of mud bricks from clay on this property. We excavated an area that later became our cellar, our root cellar, and we made mud bricks in a very low-tech way. We dug a pit, shoveled in some clay, put in some straw and water, and puddled it by foot, and then scooped out the clay, put it into a mould, and then left them out on the grass to dry. And so the interior walls of this house are made of uh, mud brick. This is it here. And we also have, this house is a passive solar house. The design is such that the summer sun, which is higher in the sky, is shaded. It doesn't shine through the, through the windows and into the house. So it's cool in summer. But the winter sun, which is 47 degrees lower in the sky in this area, shines right through under the eaves of the house and onto these this tile floor and these mud walls which absorb the warmth of the sun so it's a cozy place to, to live in a very nice living temperature and we have a wood stove as well for cooking and heating our hot water with a wet back and an earth roof we wanted we'd robbed mother nature of an area when we concreted this building footprint over. So we wanted to put that back on top to give it back to Mother Nature. We planted it with Mediterranean herbs and succulents. And now we have all kinds of weeds up there as well and flowering plants and grapevines. So it's, it's in a way, it's a garden on the roof. It provides fodder, food for our bees. So we're harvesting honey from our roof. Joe really loved aquaculture, so he wanted to have fish in the ponds here. So we created a whole series of ponds down one of the gullies of the property, and we got a permit from Doc to have grass carp here because these waterways were choked with an introduced grass called Glyceria maxima, and uh, it, it was quite common to spray those waterways to, to free it, free them up from the grass, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted a natural biological method of controlling it. So we got the permit and we have grass carp. They grow very big. They're edible. I, I personally don't find them as tasty as sea fish, but they are a speciality in Austria where Joe came from. We use compost toilets here on Rainbow Valley Farm. We believe that the food comes off the land so the waste must go back to the land. The co toilets that we have are vermicast compost toilets. The chamber at the bottom is completely enclosed, so there's no leachate into groundwater. And the chamber is like a giant worm farm. There's millions of worms in there eating away and reducing the volume of that organic matter down to 20% of its volume and we, we, we get beautiful vermicast, which is very valuable. We use it to feed our subtropical fruit trees. We don't use it in our garden, but we use it to fertilize the trees that are bulk feeders.